there's still people joining in here, but let's let's start then. Okay, welcome everyone to tonight's event. Uh, my name is Jonas Gran, and I'm a member of the International Marxist Humanist Organization, who is uh, sponsor, the sponsor of this event. Uh, I'll, I'll say just a word of uh, about what the International Marxist Humanist Organization is and a little bit about the guidelines for tonight's meeting before we start. And I hand over to Dr. Kieran uh, Durkin. Uh, the International Marxist Humanist Organization, the IMHO, is a group of uh, workers and intellectuals, students and activists who are trying to develop a notion of what a viable alternative to capitalism is. We do so by organizing meetings, book circles, by writing books and articles, uh, and by taking part in demonstrations and protests. And uh, we are a rather unique group on the left uh, in the sense that we base ourselves in the Marxist humanist tradition as the ones developed by Raya Dunevska. And on, on behalf of the organization, I, I can therefore say that we are very happy that this book, uh, the Raya Dunevska's Intersectional Marxism, published by Paul Grave Macmillan, uh, which is the topic for today's tonight's uh, discussion, has made it through to publication. It contains a number of excellent contributions which are trying to present and concretize uh, Marxist humanism for the is issues facing us today. If you are interested in uh, knowing, uh, in getting to know more about the IMHO, I urge you to check out our website, imhojournal.org. Uh, we have a free monthly newsletter you can sign up for, and uh, there you can also find information about how to contact us further. And if you would like to get in touch or a member eventually. Um, I've just a word here. I've turned off the function, uh, uh, the chat function for now, but I will turn it back on after the presentations are done. This is just because uh, there was a big interest in this meeting, much bigger than we thought. Over 110 people registered. Um, and we realized that we, as organizing of the meeting, we have, you have to have a responsibility to moderate the chat, and we just ha don't have the capacity for that now. now. So, but during the Q&A session, um, after the presentations, I'll open up the chat. And my idea there is then just to, uh, if you want to ask a question or make a comment, you write your name there in the chat function. So we sort of put your name on the stack. And then I'll call out your name, and uh, uh, you get let's say three minutes to make a comment. We start with that at least. Uh, and we can gather a few, few comments or so before we hand it over to the panelists. And I'll, I'll say also that we are recording this event tonight. So if you wanna see something again or listen to something again, you can go to our website in a week or so and it will be up there, hopefully, if everything works as it should be now when I set it up. Uh, Without further ado, I hand it over to Dr. Kieran Durkin. Thanks, Jonas. Um, <clears throat> thanks to everyone who's tuned in tonight, and particularly to Paul, Dave, Carol, and Alessandra, all of whom, I have to say, contributed fantastic chapters to the book, um, and who have kindly given up their Wednesday evening to be part of this event. So speaking on behalf of the other editors, Kevin and Heather, I can say that we're we're all very grateful. We're also very grateful to the IMHO for, for you know, giving us this platform to launch the book, to give it its, its European launch, so to speak, and to have what I'm sure will be a, a great evening of discussion on Dina Skaya and the legacy of what we're calling her intersectional Marxism. Um, as for me, I'll just make a, a few remarks about the book 
and about Dunevskaya before um, handing the floor back to Jonas and to our speakers. Um, and I suppose the first thing to say, um, and first thing I guess others should know in case they didn't, that our book is the, the very first edited collection on Dunevskaya and really one of the only pieces of the secondary literature that is dedicated to her writings at all, which is quite incredible really, considering um, the many unique and important contributions that Dunevskaya made to Marxism and to, to 20th century radicalism in general. Um, and it seems, I think, particularly incredible when you consider the, the fact that CLR James, whom she worked with for over 10 years as part of the Johnson Forest tendency or the state capitalist tendency, um, is very much a fated figure in, in certain sections of the left and in certain sec sections of academia today also. You know, he's clearly someone who has crossed over to respectable status, whereas um, Dunevskaya has tended to remain uh, somewhat on the margins of mainstream debate. <clears throat> so the, the first thing that we wanted to do then in, in putting the book together was to help rectify this situation, to help bring Dunevskaya, this really important figure in the, in the Marxist tradition, who was literally ahead of her time, and uh, I think ahead of her time in, in very important ways that we'll, we'll no doubt come on to discuss tonight, to bring her into the present moment, into, into our present moment with all its, its, all its tensions and contradictions, but also with the, the great promise that it holds. So we, we wanted to explicate Dunevskaya's ideas and engagements as well as to put them into dialogue with other ideas and engagements, both historical um, and contemporary. And to this end, we have um, chapters from a number of leading authorities on Dunevskaya, Peter Hudis, Kevin Anderson, Rodolfo Mandolfo, David Black, um, the latter of whom, of course, is, is with us tonight. We also have chapters from influential uh, public figures such as Paul Mason, the award-winning journalist, author and filmmaker, who is also with us tonight, uh, Adrian Rich, the, the famous uh, radical feminist poet, um, as well as from a whole other a series of figures um, from the intellectual and activist left in the US beyond. So we have chapters from Lily Monzo, Heather Brown, Frederick Monferrand, Dindi Katanga, and Kyle Ludenhoff and Alessandro Spano, who again, um, we're, I'm happy to say are with us this evening. And so we hope and think that this, this international and diverse set of perspectives bring um, something to the volume um, and capture something, I, I, I guess, of, of the true force of Dunevskaya's contribution to Marxism and to radicalism more broadly. Um, I certainly think it captures something of the essence of Dunevskaya. So uh, it captures something of her engagement with dialectics, with Hegel's absolutes, with the entirety of Marx. So Marx seen in his um, theoretical and practical unity, um, uh, as well as in relation to questions of race and gender, etc. All of which Dunevskaya develops in her own unique direction. Um, as we describe Dunevskaya in our introduction, she was the rare Marxist thinker at home as easily with arguments about the declining rate of profit in volume three of capital in relation to economic crisis as she was with Hegel, dialectics and the young Marx. She was also, and importantly, a thinker always attentive to the voices from below and to the masses in motion as she described them, to, in, in other words, an expanded concept of dialectics and to the revolutionary potential of, to use Marx's words, the new passions and new forces that spring up in the bosom of society. And because of this, um, I think she really is a figure who does speak uniquely to our age, to this age of, of rising authoritarianism and resurgent sexism and racism, of divisive culture wars and theoreticist pessimism, but also to an age that is nevertheless primed for the intersectional mediation of these contradictions towards 
what would be a, a new and truly humanist future. And with that, I'll hand back to Jonas and to our speakers. Thanks, Kieran. Um, you had prepared a list of an order for the speakers. Yeah, I thought if Alessandra uh, could speak first, that would be great, followed by Carl, Paul, and then Dave, just for thematic order, I guess. Okay, so I hand over the word to Alessandra then. Yeah, here I am. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, first of all, I would like to thank the International Marxist Humanist Organization and all those whose efforts have made this uh, presentation possible, along with everyone else who is taking part in it. In addition, I would like to personally thank Kieran, Kevin and Heather for inviting me to contribute to this book, in which I am honored to have participated. The publication of this book is relevant for at least two orders of reasons, in my opinion. First, it is a much needed tribute to the great figure of a revolutionary philosopher, Marxist humanist, Marxist feminist, and tireless activist, Raya Dunaiskaya. There have been, after her death, important publications, collection of her works, such, such as The Power of Negativity or The Marxist Humanist Theory of State Capitalism, just to mention a couple of them, which constitute a fundamental toolbox for anyone today, like me, <laughs> in any part of the globe, who is interested in studying and deepening the thought of this incredible woman and the collective develop, development of her thought within the political group to which she gave life. However, I believe that Raya Dunayevskaya's inter, intersectional Marxism takes a step beyond the admittedly beautiful philological and historical reconstruction and actually puts it to the test of the present. This uh, tribute is uh, specifically and valuably uh, inscribed within the enormous legacy Dunezkaya le has left us. Just as her work, often in open polemic with the debate that was contemporary to her, sought to rescue Marxism from an ideological as well as a sterile orthodoxy, which would relegate it to the knowing criticism of the party officials or mask the reactionaries, interested in using Marx to defend the present state of affairs rather than overturn it. To collect Dunayevskaya's legacy today implies that from those writings, we go beyond looking at the present and the future in order to infuse in those words the unstoppable flow of life and of the struggle for freedom in the forms in which we experience it today. And here, I think we come to the second order of reasons why this book is all the more important today. In a present market by a global pandemic that calls into question the very survival of men and women, but that at the same time dialectically reveals how were exploitation, oppression, and domination are most ferocious and brutal, it is precisely there that we can see a new beginning. The germs of revolt that cross our times, from the uprisings to the cry of Black Lives Matter, to the feminist strike, to the mass responses to our authoritarian governments as happened in Latin, Amer in Latin America or in India, to the strikes of migrant and essential labor, challenge every time the categories through which we as intellectuals interpret the present and deserve our collective and co cooperative reflection. In, it is in this sense that Dunayevskaya and their reflection must continue to question us, to tear us out of the comfort zone in which mainstream thought 
even in the radical left, often ends up stagnating and ending up rendering itself useless to the advancement of history and class struggle. To continuously think about the nexus between the praxis and theory, between the history and philosophy, as Dunayevskaya did starting from the recovery of the Hegelian dialectic, means to put philosophy at the service of the struggle for freedom and the transformations of the present state of affairs. Dunayevskaya's encounter with the, the Hegelian dialectic shows us, first of all, that every return to the past reflection, deepening of uh, an, an author, should not be afraid to betray tradition and claim heresy. However accurate the analysis and understanding may be, the impulse that moves our thoughts when it is released in, con in constant reference to reality and the possibilities of its transformation, that impulse always moves from premises that we cannot find elsewhere, but that respond to specific needs of a part of society that can embody the antagonism of a universality yet to come, negated by the reality as such. The need that at the beginning of the 50s pushes, pushed the author to make the leap towards the philosophy of Marxist humanism was the need to bring Marxism back like uh, in, a, in a double, you know, on a double level, on a, uh, on a theoretical level and on an uh, um, organizational level. To bring Marxists back to be the thought capable of grasping and giving shape to the struggle for freedom and to its subjective and collective experience. Both on a theoretical and organizational level, as we, as I said, uh, in in that uh, uh, historical moment, the very notion of class, not as sociological fetish, but as a subjective antagonistic positioning, self movement, creative self activity, within a given relationship of domination, needed to be seen in the way it was shaped by the emergence of racial and gender contradictions among the rank and file. From that position, it was clear that the, the urge to broaden the concept of what is a political organization, but also what, what, what is Marxist, was strongly influenced by the need to grasp its revolutionary potential. How to assist the autonomous organization of the working class in its multiple heterogeneity against capital. In this sense, I believe we can draw the great relevance of our reflection and the ability to speak still today to us, as well as to revolutionary subjects and their struggle. <coughs> First of all, because it is impossible to find in the four because it is possible to find in the fault of contradiction the vital first that allows the overcoming of models, political and organizational, which are no longer able to meet the needs of the present. But also, and above all, because it is the same subject of the revolution that in the process of politicization and organization questions and, rec and reconstructs itself, herself, himself, themselves, managing to break a material and symbolic identity that ends up being a cage. The dialectic of liberation primarily affects the subjects that go through it and are crossed by it. And in this sense, theory and intellectuals are not exempt from this process of continuous destruction and reconstruction of the world they inhabit 
and of themselves. So just to um, conclude my, my, my intervention, I think, uh, I think in this, uh, I can find the greatest trace that Dunayeskaya left in me as a woman, an intellectual and an activist. And I consider it an, absolute, an absolutely fertile trait that I try to make uh, germinate in my work. Thank you very much, Alessandra. That was great. Uh, I hand over the word to Carol immediately. Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> uh, before directly dealing with some issues in my chapter, it seems to me useful to make a more general remark about Dunayevskaya in recreating Marx humanism for, for her and of Dunayevskaya as to capital accumulation, the tendential fall in the rate of profit and crisis theory for the understanding of intersectionality. It has the concept of liberation. We always have to realize ourselves that she was developing those notions in the perspective of looking for the forces capable to end alienation in capitalist society and opening up ways to human liberation. The process of creating really human relations as alternative to the barbarism in all its forms of capitalist society. This is in essence, the substance of what she designated as Marxist humanism. Basic for her analysis of this process of creating really human relations, just as in Marx, is an analysis of the value dimension in capitalist society. In other words, how the process of creating value and surplus value is determining in the last instance the motion of capitalist society. <clears throat> For this process of determining in the last instance, we have to look to capital accumulation, the tendential fall in the rate of profit and crisis theory. And in a way of looking embedded in a framework which Marx so describes in his letter to Arnenkov 28th December 1846, and I quote, what is society irrespective of its form? Marx answers, the product of man's interaction upon man. Is man free to choose this or that form of society? He answers, by no means if it. And further on in this letter, we find a passage of the utmost importance for understanding the connection between economic development and man who is making history. I quote, it is a little bit longer quote, but very important. Marx says, <clears throat> needless to say, man is not free to choose his productive forces upon which his whole history is based. For every productive force is an acquired force, the product of previous activity. Thus, the productive forces are the result of man's practical energy. But that energy is each man is placed by the productive forces already acquired by the form of society which exists before him which he does not create, which is the product of the preceding generation. The simple fact that every succeeding generation 
finds productive forces acquired by the preceding generation and which serve it as the raw material of further production engenders a relatedness in the history of man engenders a history of mankind which is all the more a history of mankind as man's productive forces and hence his social, social relations have expanded from this it can only be concluded that the social history of man <clears throat> is never anything else than the history of his individual development whether he is conscious of this or not his material relations form the basis of all his relations these material relations are but the necessary forms in which his material and individual activity is realized these relatively early notions about production relations and productive forces and men in making history are so fundamental in Marx thinking that we see them later reappear in the famous preface of his contribution to the critic of political economy in 1859 resulting in a statement that the mode of production of material life conditions the general process of social, political and intellectual life. It's not the consciousness of men that determines their existence, but the social existence that determines their consciousness. Moreover, we find in this letter to Anenkov Marx's conclusion as already quoted that the social history of man is never anything else than the history of his individual development. A notion basic for a statement about communist society in its higher states, in that he is saying from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. Now I can go over to only a few topics of my chapter because of four that Raya Dunevskaya basing herself on the dialectic in production and on the human subject in capitalist society emphasizes in her notion of philosophy of revolution, the element of resistance, of revolt against capitalism by showing that it is at the basis of Marx humanism and also is ground for her era. And I can add for our era too. We know what Marx himself described as, as his intention of capital. It is the ultimate aim of this work to lay bare the economic law of motion of modern society. And because three, the law of motion of capital exists as a contradiction, the general contradiction of capitalism, Dunevskaya concludes that for Marx, <clears throat> the law of motion of capitalist society is therefore the law of its collapse. Dune, point four, <clears throat> Dunevskaya highlights that in Capital Volume One, Marx demonstrates that the development of capitalism itself creates the basis of a new humanism. And that it is because Marx based himself on this humanism, more popularly called the inevitability of socialism, that he could discern the law of motion of capitalist society, the inevitability of its collapse. She points in this context to the new forces and new passions which will reconstruct society on new, truly human beginnings. A society in which the full and free development of every individual is the ruling principle. Actually, we find here in Dunevskaya, Marx's interpretation 
already as an onset to a conception of intersectionality. Also, we find that she is taking up by emphasizing the full and free development of every individual as the ruling principle in the new society, Marx's specific concept of the individual in the sense of his letter to Arenkov. Five. In a correspondence, Marcus on 9 and Dunayevskaya on 11 October 1957, Dunayevskaya Skaya emphasizes the impact of the civil war in the United States on the structure of capital, a notion about which Marcus has strong doubts. Contrary to this doubt, she points to the structuring and restructuring of capital by Marx, in which three issues particularly come to the fore. She emphasizes from Marx's engagement with the events in the US in the 1860s, his notion that labor cannot emancipate itself in the white skin, where in the black it is branded. Second point here, she adds that finally, the American roots are not only in the finished volume one, but also in the unfinished volumes two and three. Sorry. <laughs> Moreover, that Marx in finishing volume one of Capital takes out the voluminous material on the history of theory, the theories of surplus value, and relegates it to the very end of all three volumes as book four. He is breaking so with the whole concept of theory as something intellectual, as a dispute between theoreticians and Dunievskaya concludes that Marx is turning everything around. So for Dunievskaya, Capital is a very, very different book than either Grundtvig or the critic of political economy. It is the great divide from Hegel, and not just because the subject is economics rather than philosophy. And it is that great divide because, because just because the subject, not subject matter, but subject and subject with a capital was neither economics nor philosophy but the human being, the masses. That is why Dunevskaya conceived of Marx's reconstruction of economic science so that it meant not only that his original discoveries made all the difference, but also that these original economic categories were so philosophically rooted that the new unity was created out of economics, philosophy, and revolution. How important these remarks about the nature and process of structuring of capital and especially volume one are, becomes clear when Dunevskaya examines critically Rosa Luxemburg's notions of capital accumulation. So much of the section on erroneous conception by political economy of reproduction on a progressively increased scale in capital, <clears throat> the chapter results of the immediate process of production. So say Dunevskaya answers Rosa Luxemburg that it is almost impossible to understand how she, Luxembourg, could have failed to see that the problems in <clears throat> volume two are answered in volume one, including even the reference to the fact 
that the general change of places in the circulation of wealth of society dazes the sight and propounds very complicated problems for a solution. Luxembourg was, of course, more <clears throat> um, directed at the circulation of capital instead of production uh, sphere. <clears throat> for in Dunayevskaya's critic, is the focus of Luxembourg in the process of capital accumulation on the market and individual consumption instead of on production, so that Luxembourg transforms the inner core of capitalism into a mere outer covering, and that she considers Marx to departments in his analysis of reproduction in capitalist society as only a technical question instead of a class relation and thinks that she can improve the division in the two departments by introducing a third one, <clears throat> the production of gold. Dunayevskaya emphasizes that for Marx, the law of motion of capitalist society is at the same time the law of, it, of its collapse. And that is why he had to study thoroughly the process of accumulation of capital in which the growth of constant capital in relation to variable capital is actually taking place. Her conclusion is that Marx's theory was so profound a dialectic of accumulation that at one and the same time it disclosed the different forms of revolt and how they revealed the logical development to the point where no alteration in exchange or distribution could fundam fundamentally change anything. That Luxembourg missed this element of Marx is because Luxembourg falsely counterposed reality to theory. Instead of analyzing how accumulation of capital results from the activity of labor or variable capital in the process of production, she was describing the process by which capital invades non-capitalist non lands. Marx, however, was not only engaged with a phenomenological analysis of his age, Marx surely and Tentativeness to the Marx <clears throat> surely was attend to the phenomen phenomenological reality in the very structure of capital, especially in he, how he takes up the voices of alienated, exploited, and oppressed people in his concern with their revolts. But he was in the first place interested in what was the driving force of this phenomenological reality. The big difference, Dunyevskaya says here, between Marx and Luxembourg is that Marx holds fast in his analysis to production and the focus of Luxembourg is the market. Actually, the status of capital, volume one, is at stake here as well. In this context, Dunyevskaya concludes that volume one, published by Marx, is not only, as he put it, a whole in itself, it is the whole. Seven, my last point. Dunyevskaya concludes about Luxembourg as to imperialism and colonialism. Put otherwise the dialectic, both as movement of liberation and as methodology, is entirely missing. All the opposites coexist without ever getting jammed up against each other to, to produce a movement. And so she is missing the human subject in the anti-colonial struggles. All her magnificent descriptions of imperialist oppression have no life subject arise to oppose.
they remain just suffering masses, not grave diggers of imperialism. That's my contribution. Well, thank you, Carol. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I forgot to mention also that Alessandra is uh, calling in from Sicily in Italy. Carol is in Amsterdam. I'm in Malmö in Sweden. And our next speaker on the list is in London, I believe. Uh, Paul, I'll ask to unmute you here. Well, you have to unmute yourself also. Thank you. And thank you for everybody involved in, um, thank you to everybody involved in the production of the book. I want to speak to some of the themes of the two pieces I contributed to this book, not as an academic, although I'm honored to be alongside academics on this platform, or even as a journalist, but as an activist. I've had the privilege to be an activist in two periods, two distinct periods of the class struggle. First, the what I think it was the crunch time for the proletariat after the war, 1976 through to 1989. I was 16 in 1976 when I became active in the labor movement. What we had then was a project of re resistance to capitalism. In the period from the Seattle demonstrations through to the 2011 uprisings, I think we had the growth of a different kind of movement, a, a kind of movement that had the project of transcending capitalism based on activism, climate activism, networked technologies, identity politics, and intersectionality. And that experience of living through two distinct periods of the struggle has made me critically reassess Marxism and look at every aspect of it as a valuable, but yet challengeable methodology. I spent the last few months working on a documentary series about Rosa Luxemburg and Luxemburg is someone who always comes up alongside Donayevskaya for an obvious reason, as they did in Karol Ludendorff's talk there. What does Rosa Luxemburg share with Raya Donayevskaya? I think is the belief both of them had that Marxism is the property of those who resist. That Marxism as a philosophy is an expression of the resistance. In a way, Though you could say Marx and Engels should have the intellectual property over Marxism, and indeed the communist, the, the ex-communist publisher Lawrence and Wishart in London still will not make Marx and Engels' work public domain. It, you still have to pay hundreds of pounds to just to get the, the letters. Um, that's fine, but really Dunayevskaya believed that Marxism is the property of those who resist. Now, in a period of the in the first period I was active, the mass working class activism in the, uh, in the 70s, I think it's fair to say what we created, what me, my class, my my family created was a form of revolutionary syndicalism. There was nothing anarcho about this syndicalism. It was very hierarchical. And indeed, Alessandra in, in Italy, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're and the Italians on the call as well would recognize the world that I grew up in was a world of proletarian syndicalism. Um, and I think it's fair to say then that those, that those workers understood, read, engaged with Marxism, but they regarded all Marxist theory as something to be weighed against their own experience. It was provisional. It was not a kind of academic theory that, which they were drawing down. Now, afterwards, defeat, one defeat piled on top of another. The questions which Dunayevskaya were, was engaged with, the, the, the basic questions of Trotskyism versus Stalinism, anti-bureaucratic Marxism versus bureaucratic Marxism, Hungarian revolution versus Khrushchev's secret speech, all of that, which if you read Raya's work is kind of front of her mind at that point. All those questions died away for us, to be quite honest, because when neoliberalism was in its ascendancy, anti-capitalism was anti-capitalism. The differences between us over what we might do in power, what we would do even if we controlled a trade union or a party, seemed secondary. But then, after a long gestation period in the anti-globalization movement, 
Seattle and Genoa and beyond, and the climate movement, we had this big set, second big thing. If I think about my life as a Marxist, the second big thing is the upsurge, the Arab Spring, Occupy, Gezi Park, the Brazilian protests, the YPG in Kurdistan, the Hong Kong protests uh, in the 2010s. The, in, in mainland China, in the PRC, networked Chinese underground organizing protests, which bring tens of thousands of workers on strike. That's the second big thing. Now, here, from my point of view, what I have observed is that we have a replacement subjectivity for the proletarian subjectivity that I grew up with that has been crushed or died out or replaced in a town I come from by an overt reactionary xenophobia among workers. What we have is, is a, an anti-capitalist consciousness. And something interesting um, happened in Britain when these two, as it were, the survivors from the first period and the activists from the second period came together. We took over the Labour Party. We managed to take over temporarily one of the most historic social democratic parties in the world. Because even though that generation, which I'm part of, of the 60s, 70s, 80s, was defeated, most of them didn't die. Some of them did die and some of them did, wanted not to live. But actually, the hundreds of thousands of people survived that. And they were people who flooded into the Labour Party when Jeremy Corbyn took over. At the same time, hundreds of thousands of people from the movements, from feminism, from climate, from black activism, from the network student protests, from Occupy, flooded into the party and they created an oppositional movement. Now, what was the problem? What was the surprise? What was the thing that I suddenly had to turn my attention to? Was the fact that though they spoke a common language and that common language was Marxism, the most depressing thing was that it was anti-humanist Marxism that was dominant among both generations. Uh, no, I expected because the workers from the 70s and 80s were educated by and large by the Communist Party and its offshoots. People read about Tony Benn, people read about Arthur Scargill. Ultimately, what you have there is a hierarchical Marxism. The really surprising thing was to see that the, the, set, the young generation were quite anti-humanist, but it shouldn't have surprised me really in the slightest, because really what had happened is that they learned Marxism from academia. And in academia, as you know, once postmodernism hit us, the only way you could survive was by adapting to it. So what survived was structuralist Marxism. And then what survived was postmodernist friendly Marxism. And now, in the, the very last generation of survival, we have post-humanism, transhumanism. Uh, what do they all have in common? To, if you want to find one uh, phrase that sums up this spontaneous reinvention, self-reinvention of anti-humanist Marxism, for me, it is always the phrase used by by Louis Althusser in the early 60s, when he described history as a process without a subject. For me, a, a process without a subject, is we, we meet processes without subjects every day. Here's one. Um, process without a subject is a machine. And um, Althusser understood history as a machine. And um, I met suddenly Hundreds of people who wanted to be left leftists, wanted to be labor leftists, were very, very bought into the idea of feminism, black activism, gay rights, but they didn't buy into the idea that human liberation is a project that is made possible by something called the essence of the human being, which is alienated under capitalism. In fact, when I said this, I was surprised to find myself attacked by people aged 19 or 21 as an essentialist because, because Marxism for them was an anti-essentialist thing. 
It was against humanity. It was against subjectivity. Now, when I met and started to argue with them, I, a moment of recognition took place because everybody who understands what, what we mean by the crisis of Marxism in the 20th century, the 20th century, the last century, I think you should understand that what happened was that a generation, Luxembourg, Gramsci, Lenin, Trotsky, Parvus, Karl Korsch, Georg Lukács, a generation had learned mechanistic Marxism, but they couldn't reconcile it with their practice. They couldn't reconcile it with the possibility and imminence of revolution. For them, they could see in front of them, Luxembourg could, the moment she crossed the border from Germany into Poland in 1906, here is the subjectivity of the proletariat. They will teach us what revolution is. And I think that while I was writing the article that is quoted in this book, I was looking through the archives um, and, and saw this picture in Coyoacan, Mexico, of Trotsky, Frida Kahlo, Natalia Sedova, and Raya Donovska. Raya is sitting at the, standing at the side, you can, in profile, you can see it is, it's definitely her. And I thought, as a thought experiment, what would I say to them if I could join that conversation? And what came into my head was, what I would say, look, you were taught a mechanistic Marxism, which said, history makes history. But Marx taught us that people make history. And in, unfortunately, Leon and Natalia and Frieda, you don't have access to some critical documents. One is the 1844 manuscripts, which Rea Donayaskaya translated and popularized. The other one is the Grundrisse. If you did, you would see that there is in fact a Marxist justification for your belief that subjectivity is the critical point of human history. It is what drives human history. This is what you believe, but you've looked into Plekhanov, you've looked into Antonio Labriola's writings, and you can't find it there. And you even look in Das Kapital, and as Gramsci said, we have to make a revolution against Das Kapital because it's not there, the thing we're seeking. I would like to say to them, it is there. Now, why is that an interesting thought to have? Because I think Donievskaya's discovery rediscovery that Marxism is radical humanism is of profound importance to those fighting oppression today. Like Edward Thompson, another person, a Marxist who's influenced me, Donievskaya understood that there are actually two Marxisms. There's a dead Marxism, which believes only in mechanism, and there is a, there is a dialectical Marxism, a rich human-centric Marxism, and they're not compatible. That you can't, what I discovered in trying to make Corbynism work, make Jeremy Corbyn, make the Labour Party work as a left force, was that, that the dead hand of bureaucracy, of anti-humanism, was always in our way. Now, for us, for my generation, there's a severe temptation to look at the young generation of networked activists, people act active in Me Too, Fridays for the Future, Extinction Rebellion, Black Lives Matter, LBGTQ strike, uh, struggles, and, and say, this is individualism. Actually, a Marxist humanist has, should have no problem with individualism, but it's actually not just individualism. If we understand the way in which capitalism's exploitation mechanisms proliferated and expanded and Donayevskaya was one of the first to explore the ways in which that took place in her work on workers control on the on the on the shop floor if we understand that capitalism now has multiple value streams emanating from the individual then the individual as the focus of resistance is not a bad place to start in fact i now believe it's a better place to start than class it's a better place to start because it's irreducible. As a union activist, I was always meeting young people who wouldn't join the union because they couldn't afford it, the journalist union in the BBC, but they would always join if they were harassed, 
if they were bullied, if someone didn't give them a job, if someone tried to sack them. And my older comrades and colleagues would say, well, this is, this is what's gone wrong. You know, they, they don't understand solidarity. It's just what's in it for them. I now see this as an immense strength of the generations who were involved in intersectional, intersectional struggles because they, it's irreducible. It's based on experience. And actually, it's based on a form of capital exploitation. For us, the subjectivities around us are, not, are no longer simply generated by class or even by workplace exploitation, but in a phrase which that other immensely humanist Marxist, Wilhelm Reich, once used as the title of his autobiography. The title of Reich's autobiography is People in Trouble. And I think people in trouble are those who will change the world women, black people, LBGTQ people, young climate strikers, indigenous people in places like Bolivia or New Zealand, precarious workers, consumers, they come into struggle against capital in a, ways, in a way that demands that they ask themselves the question, what is the thing I'm fighting for? And the thing they're fighting for is the right to be an unalienated human being, which I think Donayevskaya's Marxism teaches us is not an illegitimate or secondary thing, it's the core thing, it's the core objective of Marxism. I think to finish, the deeper I've got into Raya Donayevskaya's work, the more I've realized that, that she did two things. She re resurrected Hegelian Marxism. If you want to know what terrifies the reactionaries in, in the USA today, it is that. By self-identifying as a Hegelian Marxism, Marxist, I've, I've drawn a level of critique from right-wing, alt-right thinkers that, it, that has surprised me. Because I think they realize that a Marxism grounded in the experience of being human not in the experience of being an object of history, is their most difficult and challenging adversary. A Marxism that can fuse itself with, instead of, of attacking and obsessing about the att attacking on intersectionality and the struggles of oppressed people, is the most powerful Marxism of our time. And it's the only Marxism that I believe will survive in this century. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. Uh, our last speaker for tonight before we open the Q&A session is also in London. I'll hand over the word to Dave Black. OK, I'm just sorting out my Zoom here. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah, it sounds good. OK. Um, in my chapter, which is entitled The Revolutionary Travels of Right Dunayevskaya's Marxism and Freedom. I write about Dunayevskaya's travels in Italy, Britain, and France in 1959, following the book's publication. Dunayevskaya's tiny organization, based in Detroit, had broken, long broken with Trotskyism. After a quarter century or more of state capitalist counter-revolution, the Vanguard Party was no longer seen as either tenable or desirable. But this raised the question, what was the role of a small group dedicated to fighting capitalism in all its forms, including bureaucratic state capitalism? Dunayevska's group wasn't unique in this respect. There were small dissident groups all over the world grappling with the same problems. And Dunayevskaya wanted to converse with them. So in autumn 1959, she took a boat across the Atlantic in order to find publishers for new editions of Marxism and Freedom to give lectures and to meet other leftists in person and seek out organizational cooperation. I can't summarize the whole chapter in the time allotted, 
Their interactions with the Italian and French far left are especially fascinating. But I will stick to talking about her visit to Britain in October 1959. When she published Marxism and Freedom, it was reviewed by the British philosopher Alistair McIntyre, who said one of its great merits was that, quote, she has tried to write a history of Marxist theory in which development of the theory is linked at every point to the corresponding developments both in society and in the political experience of socialists. Another, he says, was Marx's explication, was Dunayevskaya's explication of Marx's indebtedness to Hegel. McIntyre writes, certainly Marx had to transform Hegel, but the ferment of the concepts of freedom, reason and consciousness in Marx's philosophy is to Marx's debt to Hegel. Hegel, without Marx, is unrealistic and, in the end, obscurantist. Marx, without Hegel, would have been rigid, mechanical, and inhuman. Dunyevskaya, in a letter to the English Marxist humanist and trade union activist Frank Williams, wrote, the very essence of the Hegelian concept that there are no so-called accidents in history, that the sum of the total accidents tells you the true course of history. So as regards any world historical event embodied in an individual, a nation, or a class, or a world religion, Dunyevskaya continues, in Hegel's view, this is not accidental, but the principle underlying human experience the individual is potentially capable of accomplishing all that humanity has explicitly realized. The wealth of human resources is his rightful inheritance and endowment. The achievement of humanity is, is his own fulfillment, its range and its height, the measure of his stature, stature and his worth." End of quote. So philosophy and thought are concrete rather than abstract. In Hegel's philosophy, uh, phenomenology of spirit, which relates e each stage of consciousness to the historic period <coughs> from Greek civilization through to the French Revolution, the whole movement from abstract to concrete is the movement from potentiality to actuality. And so for Marxist humanism, the movement from abstract to concrete was a relation of philosophy to revolution and to ideas of, of class struggle. Dunea Sky writes, I take it for granted that the proletarian developments will be the basis always and that the country that is as rich and advanced in its proletarian history as England with its levelers, uh, the diggers and the chartists. End of quote. The importance of finding the British roots of class struggle was also to, quote, find the philosophic root, which is at the same time method and result. In this case, the combined root, method and result, is neither dilettantish nor too all encompassing. It means only that today's proletariat, the English proletariat, you will find the continuators of the Hegelian tradition. And if that is not obvious, it is because no in intellectual has been looking seriously. Marxism and freedom gives us a platform. Now, I am not creating a theory out of the accident, but here is a history of Hegelianism in England to show you why my confidence has a solid basis." End of quote. Well, there had indeed been a philosophical school called the British Hegelians, who had done some translations of Hegel's major works, but none of them had very much to do with uh, the labor movement, and they had largely died out by um, the start of the Second World War. There were, however, the profound Hegelian writings in the Chartist press, 
of Helen MacFarlane, who is described by Marx in 1851 as a rare bird with original ideas compared with the mostly empirically minded Chartist leaders. But neither Williams nor Dunyevsky would have been aware of this at the time because none of the British Labour historians had ever said anything about Helen MacFarlane. So after her Italian trip, she arrives in Britain eight days after the 8th of October 1959 general election, which has returned the Conservative Party to office in a near landslide victory. She finds the British left in a state of despair. After a few lectures and meetings in England, she goes to Glasgow. Now, Glasgow was about the only place in the United Kingdom where the Communist Party had something of the same level of support as uh, their counterparts in Italy and France, even after a third of the CP membership resigned after the suppression of the Hungarian Revolution in 1956. In Glasgow, she meets Harry McShane, who's organized a couple of meetings for her. Now, he is born in Glasgow in 1891. McShane joined the Revolutionary Party of John McLean during World War I and played a leading revolt, a leading role in the revolt of Red Clyde side in 1919. In 1922, McShane joined the new Communist Party, but in, in the 1940s, he became disillusioned with the unprincipled practices of, this, of the party and its leaders' mindless subservience subservience to Russian Stalinism, left the party in the early 50s. In, in Dunayevsky's description, the two public meetings in Glasgow were extraordinary. Here is why, for the first time in a decade, all shades of radical views were represented, even dissident communists. That was the Saturday meeting. It was directly after the Labour Party defeat when too many were bewailing the fact that defeat means a backward step, whereas the meetings revealed that what the workers wanted was something greater than a vote. They wanted to, a full flag unfurled for a truly new social order. The arrangements were made by that one man, McShane, with no advertisements, just word of mouth, with a damp of rain that would have kept all but the hardiest souls at home. 40 showed up for the first meeting on Saturday and between 75 and 100 for the second one on Sunday. So that all present agreed that with any sort of preparation and advertisement, there could have been a genuine mass meeting which had, hadn't been seen in Glasgow for years. Now, interestingly, Duny Askana was very keen to meet Guy Aldred, a celebrated Scottish anarchist who was trying to bridge the gap between Marxism and anarchism and has praised Marxism and freedom. Unfortunately, she doesn't get to see him, but she does get to meet Nan Milton, the daughter and biographer of John McLean. She writes, I spoke on Marxist humanism from 1844 <coughs> through to the Hungarian Revolution in 1956 with a good deal of time on the contribution of American miners in the 1949-50 strike on the question of what kind of labor should man perform. At the end, McLean's daughter began to say that since the days of her father, she had heard nothing like such genuine Marxism. Back in London, Frank Williams organizes a meeting of, of the Painters Trade Union most of whom are auto workers. These workers want her to tell them about the conditions of American workers in the auto plants of Detroit. And she is able to enlighten them on that, pointing out that the attitude of the technocrats and the union bureaucrats who believed that automation would bring the millennium was not shared by American workers. She also meets in a separate meeting with members of the African Forum with 25 in attendance, most of them black. The forum agrees to sell Marxist humanist literature, direct from news and letters, 
and, and they invite Dunievskaya to contribute to their journal, African Outlook. She speaks to the London District Forum of the Independent Labour Party, which she notes has long been dead on its feet, but nearly 60 showed up, mainly youth who had no interest in the ILP itself. She has a very different experience at a meeting organised by the New Left Review. In this journal, Alistair McIntyre had praised Marxism and freedom, but the editors of the New Left Review were unremittingly hostile. At the meeting, quote, every tendency is present and takes time in discussion. That helps make Marxism appear mechanical, etc. However, some workers followed me here from the trade union branch, and I believe it is the first time that group ever had any workers in its audience. That the leadership and they are a worse elite than those of the vanguard parties almost boycotted the event. And one editor that did show up walked out after asking a question. Well, this gave me a wonderful opportunity in summation to attack them without gloves and ask the secretaries to take it down. One, they had complained, why was I so anti-Russian? But the kind of question they asked showed how very necessary it was, not only because they're falling into the CP trap, but because despite being in intellectuals, they, re they read not Marx, but what R. Palm Dutt says Marx says, with the result that the editor of the journal, the future philosopher Charles Taylor, presented a vulgar materialism against which it was very easy to argue. That he had not even read my pamphlet, Nationalism, Communism, Marxist Humanism, and Afro Asian Revolutions. So his concern was that since our countries were unindustrialized in Africa, I would not be interested. And I read out the paragraph, a people mature enough to fight for its freedom is mature enough to take destiny into its own hands. Three, finally for the humanists, as they call themselves, not one word was said by them. Now that I place Marxist, Marxist humanism as the only 20th century humanism. Right, I'm coming to the end. I was very interested by what Paul had to say about how Marxism, you know, genuine Marxism needs to be uh, the property of the, uh, of the oppressed, of the resistors. And he also mentioned syndicalism. And I'd like to end this talk with the words of Frank Williams in an article for News and Letters in 1961, that's 60 years ago, criticizing the depoliticization of tendencies that had broken with vanguardism and Stalinism in favor of an economistic syndicalism. This is Frank Williams. No genuine workers' movement can be built without politics, which are more profound than simple opposition to the present bourgeois reformist parties and policies. A hollow advocacy of industrial militancy, such as in the Syndicalist Workers' Federation, begs a question that workers are asking today. They need no lessons from any self-appointed leadership. Syndicalist economism has nothing to offer the working class. Marxist humanism, Marxist humanist answers are urgently needed for the major problems of man's freedom. Can the British Marxists not present to the workers the true vision of Marx so that the worker recognizes it as a inequality of his own thoughts. If capitalism is to be overcome in Britain, something more than a hand-to-mouth empirical method is required. The heyday of British imperialism drew material strength and intellectual complacency from a vast colonial empire. It still is the stronghold of empiricism. The oppressive grip of this slothful outlook has not served the British workers too well. 
even in Karl Marx's days, it was impossible to find a British publisher for capital. Official British labor still pretends that there was more to Methodism than Marxism. Thank you. Okay. Um, a big thank you to all the speakers. I think we can try to give you like a virtual applause or something. Uh, very thanks. And to all the rest of you also, this is uh, the book. If you want to read more about uh, and read all these people have been talking tonight, you can read the whole chapter. Say, I don't think this book is yet out in paperback, but it will come out soon as I have understood. Now it's crazy expensive, but it will be a, available to affordable price. Later. Um, I will now open up the Q&A session. Um, and the way we will be doing this is that um, you put your name, you write your name here in the chat. And I think I enabled it now. So everybody can write in the chat if you um, would like to ask a question or make a comment. And do so then that you write your name in the chat. And I'll Call out your name then, and uh, we said we give each be, uh, each uh, person who wants to make a comment three minutes or so at the beginning. So just put your name there in the chat if you would like to ask something. And I'll, I'll gather a few, a few names um, before we hand over the word to the panelists. Uh, I see Danny's name, Danny Evans, um, name there. You can go first, Danny. And please also, when you ask your question, identify yourself also. So Danny, go ahead. Okay, thank you. And thanks very much to the okay, sound. Thanks very much to the, the speakers and the, the organizers. That was very interesting. Um I've got a question. Well I suppose I, I I've got a confusion really that I'd like um you know the people on the panel or anyone who's attending to, to speak to, which is about um how Tonyev Sky's Marxist humanism relates to Marxist intersectionality. So um, I, prior to the event starting, I, I reread this uh, the uh, section on um, Rosa Luxemburg on the national question from Donievsky's book, Rosa Luxemburg uh, on um, women's liberation and Marx theory of revolution. And I should say, I'm, I'm very, very far from being any kind of Donievsky expert. But anyway, so I'm, so I'm sure people already know better than me that in, in this section, Donevskaya um, rehearses the arguments between uh, Lenin and Luxembourg on the national question. And um, Donevskaya says that Lenin was right and that um, national liberation, um, you know, is, is a, a kind of like a relevant sort of force in the dialectic of liberation, what have you. You know, and that was true in when Lenin was talking about it during the First World War, and it was true in the 80s when uh, Donetsk guy was writing. Um, and I want to, well, I basically want to ask like, what people, so, how people can sort of make that compatible with a Marxist intersectionality, right? Because um, it seems to me that the nation formation, right, the, the formation of nations, regardless of whether this is in a decolonial context or not, always ends up um, sort of reinforcing or it, it, like it's constituted by those like gendered and raced processes that intersectionality is supposed to struggle against as a part of like the struggle against capitalism. Um, and so I think that that's like a, a, a problem, right, in, in translating Donevskaya's ideas to Marxist intersectionality as, as I would understand it. So I'd like people to sort of respond to that, but also just like, I think there are other like sort of connected issues with it, right? P partly because, um, you know, if we're going to have human liberation, like new relationships, gen real relationships between human beings, then it seems to me that the nation 
is like the biggest obstacle to that probably. Um, also, the um, you know since, since the Dreyfus guy, like Marx, Schumann's tradition has always been very interested in like developments in philosophy and so forth. Also, like it seems to me that like this insistence on, on the continued validity or the continued affirmation of like national aspirations um, cuts off this uh, um, Marxist humanism from like um, sort of say like Paul Gilroy's contributions to planetary humanism or Julian Bembe, people like um, writing and, and thinking along those lines today. Um, but then to relate to what Paul was saying as well, it's like if, if we think about it, like, where the, the, the current sort of revival, like this zombified like neo-Stalinism that's like unfortunately seems to be gaining traction, where do those people this dead Marxism, where does it get its like validity from? Where does it claim some, you know, its continued um, legitimacy? And it seems to me that like, you know, a great, a great part of its claim comes from an identification of like Marxist Leninist, what was called Marxist Leninist um, contributions to like the struggle for decolonization. And also because like of a kind of, um, sort of natural affinity, if you like, between national liberation movements and a kind of authoritarian, macho way of doing politics and, and organizing yourself. So, I mean, obviously that's not really a question, is it? But I'm, I'm uh, honestly interested in what people think about that and how like they make it all work together. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Um, Kieran is next. Oh, you are you're still muted. Um. Okay, cool. I think I've got a new microphone confused too, but yeah. Um, yeah, I have a question for Alessandra, who, who in, your, in her excellent chapter in our volume spends a great deal of time um, outlining um, Raya Dunaskaya's en engagement with, with Hegel and dialectics and does so to some uh, definite extent alongside CLR James. And I just wondered, um, Alessandra, if, if I know you're, you're, you're ill and it's an hour later there than it is here for me, if you could say a little more about um, the connection between Raya and James on this issue and their disconnection, where they move apart, for, um, perhaps in relation to um, the, the nature of spontaneity and organization or if you prefer, just in, in terms of Hegel and, and dialectics itself. I hope that's clear, Alessandro. Um, thanks, Kieran. Anyone else? You should wait with me if there's some problem with writing on the chat. I don't, I think. I believe it's working, please. Oh, but if there's no other question at the moment, I, I'll let the speakers respond. And I give each, each speaker also three minutes, if so. Not too, too long. First, Danny had a question of how Dunevsky um, Marxism relates to intersectionality. Any speaker who wants to pick up on that? Hey, Jonas. Oh, I think Paul, Paul, you. Yeah, Paul, go ahead. Well, look. It's not a question of how does Marxism relate to intersectionality. Intersectionality has emerged as a critique of various liberation, partial liberation theories. And I think also we have to, to recognize that intersectionality is not in the same genus of things as, say, Hegelian dialectical uh, idealism or Marxism. It's intersectionality is an emerging uh, intellectual discipline um, 
which recognizes what that that i th i think we materialists have a right to have a materialist critique and analysis of intersectionality and for me what it is it's a it's it is the spontaneous ideology of oppressed people who who finally realize that you that you that you can define your oppression beginning from the individual you can embrace the group and kimberly crenshaw makes it very clear as she says in this stage of history the group is the thing that needs to re to, to to resist um a Marxist restatement of intersectionality would for me be to say, here's workplace exploitation, here's financialization, here's sexual exploitation, here's racial oppression, here is LGBTQ oppression, here beneath them all is human self-alienation. And on each of these dimensions, individual human beings have the right to construct a picture of their own self self alienation and exploitation no in other words there needs to be a dialogue between marxism and 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 um and intersectionality but i have no problem de de defining myself as an intersectional marxist because what it gets you over remembering that intersectionality is also a critique of the feminism of the 70s and 80s and of the black liberation theories of the 70s and 80s which were to, to give them their technical, to, to describe them technically, dual system theories. To, so there's class and there's race, there's class, there's uh, gender. And what intersectionality does is to say, no, let's begin from the, I, from the individual and the structure of their exploitation and construct a picture of it. So I think it's an unfinished dialogue between us. Um, so so that, that is why I think that one can describe Donayevskaya in her work in the 50s and 60s as an incipient thinker along those lines. Uh, and in a, what are we saying she wasn't? What she was not was a substitutionalist because Marcuse and others tried to substitute the oppressed, whether it's the urban oppressed, black people, uh, colonial struggles. Marcuse was happy to substitute those groups for the proletariat. Donayevska was trying to um, include, let's, let's say that's the best way to describe it, to include the experience of those groups and individuals in the experience of Marxism as a, what we all I think agree on here is Marxism as a theory of human liberation. Yep, thank you. Uh, Alessandro, do you want to respond to the question? Yeah, I'll try <laughs> at least. <laughs> well, um, oh. I think uh, uh, that um, somehow we can find in the specific interpretation of uh, Hegelian dialectic and the relevance, the centrality that it has in the Dunayevskaya's uh, um, thought we can find that the way to understand why we can look at their Marxism as a intersectional Marxism. But before I would like to give my just a, a few words about uh, how, why I uh, appreciate the use as an adjective of intersectional Marxism and uh, uh, rather than the intersectionality as a substantive, as a, as a, as a name, I don't know, substantive, probably. <clears throat> because uh, it is some, somehow something uh, uh, linked to the difference between the transcendence and transcendental as a method, like as a something that we must keep in mind. Um, in, in terms of uh, uh, intersectional, um, I think that in the, in the substantive intersectionality, we, we take too much uh, at, the, uh, at the center, uh, the idea of, the, of, the, of a section in which uh, different oppressions just add one on the, on the other. Um, um, instead, if we think intersectionally, 
Mar like intersectional Marxism, we uh, take into consideration like uh, the the whole society as a whole, and uh, this whole was described described by Dunayevsky exactly as a um, um, contradictory whole, as a, a, a movement. As something that is movement, uh, considering the the, the 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 dialectical movement of reality, so something uh, that uh, uh, um, allows allow there and allows us today to uh, like to always to think what she called the, the um, you know like the. The, the 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 reaction within the revolution, the the contra revolution within the revolution that may be also on a um, uh, that may be considered on different levels, such as uh, like the historical moments she was referring to, but also in how the what we consider the revolution revolutionary subject, for example, in feminism was in, internally. Uh, crossed by lines, by fault lines that deeply differentiated the, the subjects uh, within it. For example, if, if we are talking about um, a black woman or a white woman, a working class woman or a middle class woman, a third, uh, a, um, a woman who lives in, in Africa or in the United States. So all of these positions uh, are quite different from each other, but the that uh, um, that dialectical method that uh, we can also reframe within intersection intersectionally thinking is exactly not to stop at that at those differences, just uh, to reproduce them as something that cannot communicate, but uh, to put them in a movement and in a um, dialogue that uh, is something that creates a new uh, a new basis of uh, political organization and uh, political communication within different conditions so if uh, i don't know if i answered the <laughs> the question that um, danny was uh, was um, but uh, this is my idea like uh, since uh, in her uh, in her work was so relevant the the composition the heterogeneous composition of revolu revolutionary subject but also the the fact that it was something on the move that was not something that can be fixed one once for all once for uh, forever but it is something that must be must be challenged not only in the pra in practice but also on a theoretical uh, on a theoretical level and uh, in in this way i think that her Hegel hegelian like re encounter with hegel uh well, allowed her to um you know to to have some uh, glimpse on something that we are experiencing now uh, this mu multiplicity and the heterogeneity uh, of composition in uh, um, in the in the subject, like in the, in the revolutionary subject. Yeah, thank you, Alessandra. Anyone else wants to make a comment or ask a question? The stack is empty, so. Hi, Jonas. Um, Danny, I don't know if you're if you're still there or not, but um, um, I think you, there was a part of your question. I think um, Alessandra gave a great answer in terms of the you know the revolutionary intersectionality that I think we we, we find in Diana Sky's work that is distinct, perhaps, from some of the the, the, the accounts that we I guess more associate with that that term. But Danny, correct me if I'm wrong. I think you were asking something. To the effect of um, or questioning the progressiveness of um, 
national liberation struggles um, in, in relation to intersectionality and, and to the regressive aspects of, of national liberation struggles. Is, is that correct, first of all, Tony? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't use the term progressive probably, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's more or less what I'm getting at, yeah. That, that you know, that I don't think we can disentangle nationhood and the process of nation formation from race formation, from, you know, gender. I think um, that all of those, like, processes have been fundamental in constituting um, the capitalist social formation. And the great merit of intersectionality, you know, as, as Paul said, not really in response to what I was saying myself, but, you know, th th is that it enables us to, like, try and see those things as one and, like, to see the, the struggles against them as related to one another. But regardless of whether, you know, Dunia Skaya thought that, that, that you know, and, and clearly, like, her and Lenin didn't, you know, they thought that, like, a, a national revolution, a national liberation movement wouldn't just stop there and would be able to keep going. But... To keep insisting that that's what happens with national liberation movements after the entirety of the 20th century just seems to me to be like dogma. You know, it's 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 not what it's not what's happened. It's not what happened. The aspiration is actually important. You know, and the the, the national aspiration works contrary to you know the broader human liberation and and, con and contrary to this. You know what I would what I imagine is Marxist intersectionality and and as as Paul. You know, gave the exposition, and that's what I think. Anyway, I hope that's clear enough. Yeah, thank you. I, I think uh, uh, Richard and Peter put themselves in stack. We can take the questions also, and then we can uh, let the panelists respond again, and can maybe come back to comment again, Danny, if they want to. But Richard, you're next. Uh. Okay, I think um, you know, Danny made some very challenging points, and uh, uh, I, with, without claiming to answer them in full, perhaps I can say some things which um, uh, take the discussion forward a bit. Um, so, one of the reasons that um, you know, I, I first encountered uh, Raya Junaidskaya's Marxist humanism in the late 1970s. And, and one of the reasons that it appealed to me so much was that uh, uh, it recognized multiple forces of revolution. Uh, you know, the, the word intersectionality was what, not one that uh, Raya Junauska herself used. Um, she's, um, but I think she had the concepts, absolutely. Um, uh, the term she, she often used herself was dimensions. So she would talk about the black dimension, the women's dimension. Um, and you know, in speaking of um, Marxist humanism in the United States, you know, uh, uh, her tendency recognized four principal forces of revolution, which were uh, rank and file workers, uh, the black liberation movements, women and youth. But of course, these were never meant to be exclusive. And um, uh, at the time when I, that I encountered it, um, uh, uh, Marxist humanism was also very much engaged with the with Latino struggles, um, with Native American struggles, with uh, gay, and, gay and lesbian struggles as, as well. Um, <laughs> And um, uh, in a quotation from a, a worker member or sympathizer, which was overused at the time, but is, is perhaps it's time for revival is perhaps come. Um, she said, and I can't quote the exact words, but it would be nice if we were exploited as, uh, as white, as workers on Mondays and Tuesdays and as women on Wednesdays and Thursdays um, and, uh, and as black people on uh, on 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 Fridays, but but it all hits it all hits you at the same time, and 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 you can't separate them, and um, yeah, and that is a. Uh, I think that's that, that's um, intersectionality in a sentence, really. Um, on the 
on the problems of national liberation movements, you know, and, and I think that I think this is a very real problem. Um, again, I wouldn't say that uh, Juno Scar had all the answers, but she she did. You know, while she was a great supporter of national liberation movements, she was also a, a great and fierce critic of um, authoritarian and reactionary tendencies within them. Uh, and for, for example, this came out in her tour of um, West Africa that she undertook in, in the early 1960s, uh, you know, where, she, where she encountered um, leaders who were saying that, you know, um, the workers should shut up and, and, and not and stop making class demands because they were interfering with the national independence and the um, uh, and the struggle against imperialism. And Raya totally opposed that view, and, 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 she, and, and she thought that it was only by the the unfolding of all of these liberation movements, you know, that you could uh, uh, move towards a, a truly new society. Thanks, Richard. Peter, you next. Uh, thank you. Just a brief comment. Um, the other night, two nights ago, I went to see the new Fred Hampton film, film about Fred, Ham Fred Hampton, the Chicago Black Panther, who was, of course, viciously murdered by the Chicago police and the FBI in 1969. And it opens with a scene of Fred giving a speech in Chicago, and it's actually what he actually said, um, where he's uh, counterposing reform to revolution and talking wh why the struggle has to not be limited to reform but everything has to be on behalf of revolution. A friend of mine just then asked me as we're walking out of the theater, um, basically, um, do you think Fred Hampton read Rosa Luxemburg? Because so much of this sounds like what she wrote in Reform or Revolution in 1898. I thought about it for a little bit and you know, did a little bit of checking around because I like Rosa. And uh, um, I don't think there's any chance that he did because Rosa Luxemburg was kind of off the scene in, of the black movement, indeed, even the new left in general in 1968, 1969. So why was she off the scene? Why in the anti-colonial left was Luxembourg off the scene? There's very few people within that milieu who even commented on it. One of the few was Walter Rodney, but he did so rather dismissively because he thought she was idealistic and impractical because of her critique of the Bolshevik policies after 1917. So I think that there's something involved in that. In the debate, when Dunyevsky, I think, is debating Luxembourg and the national question, it's not so much about the nation, frankly. Uh, it's, it's about the question of the self-developing subject, and it's about a critique of abstract revolutionism. Um, because, as Fanon noted, um, I mean, Fanon, and she writes a pamphlet in 1960, which is the same time Fanon is writing Wretched of the Earth, which makes very, very similar arguments. She basically says the Pan-African movement and it's being canalized into state capitalist channels. This is even before the great year of independence actually is completed in Africa in 1960 and takes very sharp issue with a lot of the tendencies within the uh, African left that turned the blind eye to that potential problem in which nation building was put ahead of the self-emancipation of the masses themselves. So it's a, it's a complex issue, which obviously you can't do justice to very briefly, but I, I think it was a critique of abstract revolutionism that when masses of people are moving in a certain direction and there's an opening for the expression of their subjectivity in a struggle for national liberation, depending on the circumstances, of course, and what that means at a particular historical moment, to stand back from that kind of puts you out of the connection with the subject. And I think that's, I think what Paul was you know, raising very well here was a Marxism that loses touch in any level with the human subject loses the ability uh, to have any kind of intersectional perspective. And so we have to be frank and acknowledge that intersectionality, much of intersectionality theory is anti-Marxist or non-Marxist because much of it is so influenced by Foucault, which was explicitly anti-humanist. So a really good question would be that I have for the panel, in what way does Dunievskaya's intersectionality differ fundamentally from Foucaultian intersectionality or those influenced by Foucault, many intersectional thinkers have been deeply influenced by him in turning away from Marxism. Yeah, that's a good question to the panelists, but uh, we have another uh, who wants to make a comment, a question or comment before. Rocio. Hey, 
rewind. So I had a question. It was based on what Paul Mason said about um, <clears throat> how he found the Corbynist left, the young left, was anti-humanist and how that surprised him. I was just going to ask why people think that the neo-Stalinist left or the anti, or just generally like a more anti-humanist left is gaining traction with the youth. I'm in my early 30s and uh, it's not as, the anti-humanism is not as strong as like in my little bracket, of my age bracket, but uh, especially with younger people who are like five years younger than me, I see it, it's a lot more popular. And I wonder what that's about um, because it's, in the United States where I live, uh, like the socialist left is so, it's a baby, it's very young. Like the explosive, like the, at least the mass socialist left is very new, like the last five years. Um, and then like, whereas the, you know, racial struggles and feminism and this and that, even as you were sort of, they're much, they're more, they're more developed. So I'm wondering where, why people think this like anti-dialectical left is coming, why it's resonating with the youth. Thank you, Lucia. Um, anyone else who wants to make a question or comment or should we, otherwise we hand over the word to panelists. Yeah, I don't see anyone who puts up the name on this chat down stack. So, okay, panel, pick and choose whatever comment or question you heard here. Paul Short, do you want to start? Can I just go very briefly on Rocio's question? Right, okay. The first source is definitely postmodernism, but there's a deeper source. Uh, and I think that maybe you in your experience you have this no marxist of my generation could be seen dead appreciating friedrich nietzsche there is nothing progressive in nietzscheanism and yet i mean nietzsche is the anti-humanist 101 and yet so much of the left discourse is based in nietzsche in genealogy rather than causation in anti-humanism in in power worship, this is a problem. This is, I, I, for me, this is the, the root problem. But there's also an experiential problem. Let's remember, in Fanon's era, what drove, what, what drove large parts of the anti-imperialist black left towards a neo-Stalinism was the fact that they said, quite correctly, we, you, 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 the Marxists, cannot ask us to wait for a historical process whereby we industrialize and even through an uneven and combined development, we achieve a proletariat. We want freedom now. And if, if Che Guevara and Nairere and Lumumba offer us through national liberation struggles a route to self-liberation, then pardon my language fuck you to the historical process um we want that now and if that means adopting jacobin hierarchical ultra leninist forms of organization then we're going to do it now today i i meet this everywhere in our own blm movement here in london there is definitely a black liberationary maoist stalinist um group um in New York City, where I attended the, um, the People's Forum, I think that is an interesting place where neo-Stalinism has to meet movement politics. Look, neo-Stalin. What what has convinced me is that Stalinism will re it will re um, create itself. It wasn't a product of the Soviet bureaucracy. It, in fact, it was. It's, I see it as a product of Leninism. I know Rea Donetskaya had a soft on Lenin after the Hegel logic um, notebooks. I don't anymore. Um, I see it as an inbuilt problem with Leninism and it's going to be there. And therefore, the, the, way to, for, the way to start a conversation about it for me is what is the essence of a human being? Um, it's, it, it, it's Marxist essentialism. 
is the is the root because if you can see a human being as an essential thing which has which has rights and a future and a teleology you cannot put them in a gulag you cannot in your own mind justify them being in a, in a gulag this is actually a live issue right now in in such a place as bolivia where everyone all has morphed into a very very i would argue sort of anti-imperialist uh anti-human rights, anti-liberation uh, thinker in a way that I know that some of the other Bolivian left are not because the pressure of the imperialists on them, the pressure of that coup, the pressure of the horrific stuff that was done to them is pushing them to who are our allies. And if you ask the Morales wing of the mass, who are our allies, it's China and Russia. And it's as simple as that. Carol and Dave, would you like to respond to any of the questions or the comments or this discussion that's been going on so far? I think Dave is picking up here his microphone here. Can I speak? Yeah, sure. Carol, go ahead. Uh, the only thing I'm dis uh, I'm missing in the whole discussion this evening uh, about <clears throat> intersectionality is the value dimension. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> it is not for nothing that Marx was studying economics, uh, developing a critique of political economy because the economy in the last instance is determining where in society human beings are and what they are. That determining, <clears throat> uh, in, in, this, in this sense, they are determined and are reacting back on the de further development of society. So if you are talking about subjectivity of people, classes, races, uh, gender movements, and so on, <clears throat> you have to see what place they uh, take in the whole organization of, in the last instance, the economic development of capitalism, because in the last instance, it it uh, the central point is of course the motion uh, the law of motion of capital capitalism yeah thank you Carl. um chris gilgan i note your name here but i i promise to let dave respond just first hmm. uh, if he has his microphone working now yeah um as we've seen in the um, in the so-called culture wars, right? You've got um, you know the Trumpites uh, uh, were for four years having a great time, really. What they called, yeah, you know, doing things that make liberals sad, things that really piss up liberals. Yeah, and now there's like a kind of um, a kind of revolution against Trumpism. You've got like uh, people who are known as tankies, right, or campists, who um, don't actually believe that society can change very much, but that, but they themselves are now fighting this culture war. So, like, if you say Stalin was all right, you know that really fucks off the uh, uh, the far right great, eh? Or, or, you know, Mao wasn't so bad after all. Um, and I think, you know, the problem is that um, all these ideologies, as, you know, comrade Adam Curtis has pointed out in his latest TV series, all these ideologies have got nothing left to say. And so we're looking at the situation where, you know, ideas uh, uh, the battle of ideas is intensifying, in, and we're not just having to take on 
you know, Stalinism and social democracy. As Paul points out, it's incredible now we've got to take on Nietzsche, right? And, and you know, no doubt, uh, uh, you know, Heidegger as well. So, you know, it's all getting very interesting. That's what I've got to say. Chris Gilgan. Thanks. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep, yeah, sounds great. Um, I, I, um, I think the, the discussion's been really interesting. Um, one of the things I was struggling with a bit at the start is the use of the term intersectionality. Um, because it seemed to be used in a way that assumed, uncritically assumed, that intersectionality is something positive or it's always uh, something critical. And um, so it's good to see people raising problems with it later. Um, you know, I think intersectionality is a, uh, a category that is thrown around a lot today in ways that are meaningless or ways that actually undermine or try to undermine or neuter uh, liberatory potential. Um, Hillary Clinton, when she was standing for president, was presenting her election campaign as an intersectional one. Um, that should ring alarm bells for us. Um, I think that uh, if you look at some of the discussions about intersectionality, often um, the Combahee River Collective are identified as being the originators of the term, but they don't actually use the term at all. Um, the way in which they talk about um, black feminism, uh, radical black feminism, a, a lesbian black feminism, I think does have a, a continuity with the likes of Black Lives Matter today. And I think it's something completely different from Kimberly Crenshaw and the, those uh, critical uh, academic legal scholars because where Hillary Clinton and Crenshaw and others are talking about intersectionality, it's in a way which deprives uh, the subject of its subjectivity, deprives us of our uh, ability to act, and is more identifying people as something who have something in common as uh, victims, those who are the oppressed who are victims, rather than those who are active agents. And the Combahee River Collective were talking about the position of being black lesbian women, which when I was involved in the Trotskyist left, uh, we thought of this as being sectionalist um, and uh, looking after themselves. But Reading back over it, I think the thing, one of the things that really comes through is that particularism as a universal. So in the way in which various people today have talked about what is the common humanity within uh, being black, being lesbian, being feminist, it's not about being oppressed, it's about desiring freedom. That's the, the common humanity, that's the the thing which is the universal that is being articulated by those in that position of being oppressed. Um, and I think today that where I thought, I think this is, I've come across this as, as best articulated is the response of Black Lives Matter when presented with the, uh, the claim, you're being sexualist, all lives matter. They reply by saying, well, all lives can't matter until Black Lives Matter. And in that, the presenting the, the universal humanity. Um, what, so, so I suppose what my question is, 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 I haven't read the book yet. I've read the introduction, I've read bits of, of a few chapters, but what I don't see is a critique of intersectionality as a term itself. Um, and I don't, I, I've quickly done a, a search to see if Crenshaw appears in, and doesn't seem to appear in the book or as mentioned also. Uh, is that an oversight? 
in the book and is that something that needs to be done uh, going forward to, to critique the, the concept of intersectionality or to reclaim the concept of intersectionality or to give the concept of intersectionality uh, a liberatory impulse rather than just using it uncritically. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Um, we're running out of time here, but I'm sure all the panelists uh, a lot of the panelists would like to respond to that. So let's say we gave, give each of the panelists a final word and then we'll wrap up this for tonight. So go, go ahead, speakers, and if you want to respond to this. There is Andrew Milson who wanted the floor, right? Um, sure. Okay, we can take Andrew Milson. Your, your question will be the last one then. Go ahead, Andrew. Uh, hello there. I, I just, it's a simple question to, to Paul Mason. In a tweet, he said, um, this center is going to be between Marx and Nietzsche. And then he's always, um, if it is, then surely we need to be addressing the argument more than just dissing the Nietzsche stuff. I just want to think there needs to be more thought given to the arguments against these situations than just the constant dissing that's going on. Just any thoughts back? Okay, well, a final word from all the speakers. Who would like to start? I can start if any, anyone else is. Well, first of all, uh, I need to answer uh, to Kieran and I excuse myself because just uh, I, I thought before that we were answering to, to different questions in different rounds. So that's the only reason. Uh, <clears throat> I try to be very quick uh, and even if uh, is uh, Yes, a uh, question uh, is uh, like uh, <laughs> takes a lot to uh, to to answer to be answered fully. Uh, I think, but uh, um, I think uh, it may be also a point to touch uh, other points that have been uh, at the center of the discussion. Uh, the difference, uh, uh, like uh, CLR James and Ryan and Sky, uh, of course, shared. Um, shared uh, many years of, uh, of, of uh, activism together and uh, political projects together. So you, we cannot uh, uh, put them um, like uh, in contradiction uh, with, without uh, uh, before uh, having uh, taking into account the 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 the, the, the 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 different part the, the the same path they 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 uh, developed together. So um, of course uh, the Johnson Forest tendency uh, has been uh, uh, something very important to for the political uh, formation of uh, Ryan and Skaya and uh, the the activism with uh, um, with black and uh, youth and like the the, the subject that were uh, uh, listed before is uh, uh, at the center. Uh, they uh, shared the, 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 crit the, the a criticism uh, towards uh, the, the, the form of party that was uh, actually um, in, the, in the 40s uh, that was uh, um, the one they were facing and the, 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 that wasn't able to, to grasp the, the, the novelty of uh, for example black uh, central of uh, black people's centrality uh, within uh, labor struggles or uh, um, for example we we can consider the slogan black and white let's unite and fight just erasing the difference the, the, the different conditions in which that work was uh, was uh, called to be uh, to be uh, acted to be the, the, the political conditions of uh, being a black worker and um, so uh, they shared this uh, this uh, criticism uh, against the, the the form of political party and uh, the um, also the um, they were uh, not uh, they did um, 
they did criticize the uh, the pragmatistic approach that was uh, common in the in the American left. Yeah, at the time, we can uh, just uh, uh, just mention Sidney Hook, but others may be, may be uh, on the list. Um, so uh, the, um, the urgency of, uh, of uh, rethinking the, the very form of the party, the very, to rethink the very form of organization uh, moved both of them. But uh, the in the we can say in the in the in the path they diverged. Uh, they uh, decided together to uh, reread uh, reread um, uh, Lenin uh, and uh, the notes on uh, uh, notes on dialectics uh, is a book uh, that James wrote. Uh, about uh, about this uh, this work of um, deepening the 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 Lenin dialectic Hegelian dialectics the the in the in the notebooks, but uh, what dif what uh, uh, what we consider different was uh, the uh, the result because. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, James just uh, skipped on the uh, on the complexity of organization. Uh, taking uh, while we can say that Dunayeste took it seriously in terms of the dialectical process between a spontaneity and forms of organization. So this dialectical uh, mm, relationship cannot be. Uh, just uh, uh, swept away, like uh, uh, just declining on spontaneity as such, as in the beginning James seemed to want. But at the end of the day, at the end of the <laughs> of the process, if we um, consider spontaneity something that is sufficient uh, to answer the, the the needs for political. For political initiative, uh, it is very common <laughs> that we end up in, with uh, uh, with uh, forms of leadership that are not truly uh, shared by the, by the rank and file. So, like uh, the the, the two, um, spontaneity and hierarchy are uh, something that uh, may be um, uh, very um, very often uh, intertwined. Uh, so taking seriously the, the problem of organization means uh, like uh, how we can uh, build uh, some forms of like process of uh, political organization that can be uh, uh, themselves uh, questioned continuously by the spontaneity, but at the same time spontaneity is not sufficient to uh, give them a direction. So um, it is in this, uh, in this uh, continuous process of, uh, um, of transformation and uh, destruction and uh, re uh, rebuilding this uh, 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 relationship that, uh, that uh, um, she needed to make a step forward and uh, take, uh, um, take the plunge, what she, she called, to take the plunge into Hegel and uh, a, move, a move forward a philosophy of organization that is uh, the, the, the Marxist humanism for her. And uh, of course it involved also like a political um, uh, division and uh, different kind of, uh, and different kind of uh, paths uh, in, 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 uh, in politics. If I have time, I don't know, Jonas. Maybe I'm not, I'm running too much. Uh, yeah, if you wrap up. Yeah, just uh, um, in order to to put this, I think that it, it this has to do what we um, with the question about intersectionality. Intersectionality, like uh, um, I think that uh, uh, that uh, just uh, we. Like this is not a book on intersectionality. So first of all, <laughs> it's a book about uh, Raya Dunayevsky as intersectional Marxism. So it is much more um, important, I, 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 in my opinion, to uh, take uh, the um, like uh, the inputs she gave us in order to to rethink 
what can be an intersectional Marxist today. So uh, this dialectical relationship may be like uh, always the way in which we uh, can understand an intersectional, uh, an intersectional Marxist as something that is capable, as Karel uh, was underlining before, not to uh, just uh, put uh, like uh, uh, on a line the different kind of victimhood, victim, victimization of oppression that people can experience in their life, but just to see how uh, different oppressions shape each other, each other in this whole, that is uh, the, the capitalist, capitalist society and how the, the, the same uh, point of contradiction or the highest point of, of contradiction can be the, the highest point of advancement for class struggle or like a struggle for freedom, how we can call them, call it. Sorry for, uh, for the time. Uh, no worries. Uh, Dave, do you, want, do you wanted to say something also? Yes. Um... It kind of follows on from what Alessandro just said. I mean, uh, uh, Raya Junesca did not use the term intersectionality, but she certainly believed that um, you don't abandon the struggle for women's liberation in order to uh, you know, save the nation. You don't abandon uh, attention to police uh, brutality, you know, defund the police in order to um, keep, it, keep the Democrats in power. And I think that I think the key word she used was coalescence. And what she meant by this, it can be seen in an article she wrote in, in 1970, um, when she was asked about what she thought about the counterculture, about, you know, the left that was around at the time you know, the post sixties left. Um, you know, this was the era of not only the Black Panthers, but also, also the weather underground. And she argued that, you know, violent spouting, as she called it, gave the right wing terrorists, by which she meant Richard Nixon, the excuse to conduct their preventative civil war before the objective conditions and subjective forces have coalesced to assure the victory of the social revolution. And as regards the hippies, she said, although the hippie counterculture was certain, quote, quote, certainly a superior phenomenon to the establishment, end, unquote, its self-separation from the rest of American society was precisely, precisely what capitalism does want. That is to say, to break up the revolutionary, the various revolutionary forces from ever finding each other. Yeah, that's an argument for coalescence. <laughs> Karel or Paul, do you want to make some final? Uh, I've spoken a lot, so I just want to say one thing. Um, it's not about dissing Nietzsche, but it's about identifying anti-humanism, systemic anti-humanism, as the core of what we as humanist Marxists are up against. Um, and I think that what front of everybody's mind though is and should be the struggle against the alt-right and fascism. And what I say to leftists who are trying to fight the new fascism is how do you think you're going to fight it when, when through postmodernism what you have is an ideology totally based on the reinvention of Nietzsche. Everything in there is, is Frederick Nietzsche. And so you have to be able to have a critique of Nietzsche. The, 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 the other thing is, I, I somebody mentioned earlier, Alistair McIntyre, it was Dave, it was, uh, I think it was you, David. Yes. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a, I agree with McIntyre on one thing, or rather, I've extrapolated from McIntyre at this point that one of Marxism's biggest lacunae is its boycott of moral philosophy. And in moral philosophy, there is only Aristotelian Marxism, Nietzscheanism, 
and liberalism. That, that's all there is uh, in modern academic, modern philosophy. And I think that moral philosophy, and I think there, it's the struggle against Nietzsche is the struggle of the 21st century. If you lose it, you're just in amoralism and you, you lead to fascism. So there's a lot more to say about that, but that's where I think that uh, that's something that in Donetsk's thought that isn't very, it's not very there, but it has to be in, a, in, a, in a, any reclaimed humanistic Marxism has to have a moral philosophy. Karen? Uh, yeah, I, I would say a few things. If we are talking about intersectionalism, um, I said in my <clears throat> contribution, we have it about the conception of race, class and gender, but in a framework of a dialectics of liberation. So you can't... Um, the, the, the term intersectionality an sich <clears throat> is uh, not sufficient. Uh, for example, if you are taking the term or the, the notion class in the Max Weber uh, sense, this is totally different of class in Marx or Lenin. Yeah, th that's I, don't agree. I don't agree with that. I don't agree. Oh, it's Dutch, German. You met this guy in Amsterdam. I'm sorry? German? I think you can continue, Karen. Karen. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. um, that's one thing. <clears throat> and then um, sure oh. intersectionality uh, in Dunayevskaya. Uh, she is emphasizing uh, in the development of capitalism new forces and passions. And that is what I said, really an onset to intersectionalist uh, Marxism. I think that is an important element what she has as new brought to the fore. Um, then we have as to Marxist intersection, what I said <clears throat> about the great divide uh, Dunyevskaya sees in the opinion of Hegel and uh, what Marx is saying in Capital, that it is <clears throat> not a uh, uh, great divide because it's economics or philosophy, but that Marx is the most important things in, in the moment is, I think, what is a human being? So we have to see the difference between natural things and what is specific for a human being. That are elements we, we have to work out. That is what I can say at the moment. Well, thank you, Karel. Um, and thanks to everyone else here. Also. I'm sorry we ran out over the time a bit, but uh, I found it a very stimulating discussion, at least. Kieran, you opened everything. Do you want to close it with some uh, final final remarks? So. Uh, yeah, Jonas, thank you. Um, thanks to our speakers and who did, did uh, fantastic uh, papers and a very lively discussion, I think, around some issues that um, I hope the book has thrown up around intersection, intersectionality, around uh, dialectics, around national liberation or, or, or self-determination, um, as we ought to, ought, ought to think of it. Um, uh, I, I cannot stay for long. I'm actually overdue help with putting my, my kids down, but I hope that others, will, hope some of you will Buy the book, have a look at the book, and and continue the, and continue the discussion as we as we move forward. Sorry, I'm very tired, so.